Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We are studying together the letter to Philemon. So thank you for joining us. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the opportunity that you give us to feast together upon your word. May the Holy Spirit guide us into all truth. May you seal to our hearts that which is truth, filtering out all of the foolishness that we may grow in grace and knowledge of Christ our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. We are studying together in the letter to Philemon verse by verse. In our last time together, we were at verse 11, Philemon verse 11. Again, I don't need to take much time refreshing your memory concerning the story that is contained in this letter. A slave named Onesimus has fled from his master, Philemon. Now, whether or not he stole from his master, I don't know. No, no one else can say for certain a lot of speculation there that he that he did. The general assumption is that it would have it would have been impossible for a slave to get from Colossae to Rome without some kind of substance, which he probably would not have had. So it may be that he stole from his master Philemon and that he fled to Rome in the providence of God. Onesimus was led to Paul and Paul to Onesimus. Onesimus found out that he was of God's elect and now he's being sent back to his master Philemon carrying this letter. And what I've pointed out in each study is we have no doubt that that's the truth, that there really was an Onesimus, that there really was a, a Philemon, there was a Paul. This letter was written. These are facts of history. But I also believe that one when one looks at the Word of God through spiritual eyes, there are vast messages which are not at all apparent to those who are not of the family and the household of God. After all, the author is not Paul. The author is the Holy Spirit. A lot of times the emphasis is put on, on the human author. The author is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has chosen to include this letter for our learning and our maturity in the things of Christ. And I've been going through the epistle, not asking you in any way to doubt the historical validity of this epistle and the facts that are contained within it, but, but to see in it a message that God is teaching us about his sovereignty and his grace. And I pointed out last week, I believe I pointed out last week, we see that in, in account after account in the Word of God, we see that same sovereign grace. One would have to be spiritually blind not to see in Joseph a type of Christ 
in Abraham's servant, a type of the Holy Spirit, and so on and, and so on. In Isaac, a type of Christ. In, in Abraham, a type of God the Father. And we could go on and on with type after type. Wherein we learn great lessons because the sovereign God has determined to put language in our frame of reference. And so we've seen the Holy Spirit point out the preciousness of the bond that exists between believers and more importantly, between God and God's children. Now in our last study, we looked at a few aspects that are contained in verses nine through 11 that the appeal is made based on the service of Paul and the mediation made for us through the Lord Jesus Christ and that that is based on his finished work. In the service of Paul, his present position, he's now a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Christ is now exalted, seated at the right hand of the Father. So he not only mediates based on his service, his finished work, but he mediates on his present position. He brings into that mediation his relationship. My son Onesimus. He brings into that the, the process of the incarnation that through his, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, listen dearly beloved, through the finished work of Christ, we stand before God without spot and without blemish. And he presents the grace of God, which in time past was unprofitable, but now is profitable. That's grace. I do not believe that we can look at the 11th verse, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me and say that there was some tiny flame in Onesimus. Therefore, all he had to do was meet someone like Paul and just have it flamed or, or fanned until it, it burst into some tremendous fire, bringing out the good qualities that were always there lying dormant in Onesimus. That is not what the verse says. The verse says he was incurably wicked, totally unprofitable, nothing in him to be desired. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he is totally profitable, nothing in him to be undesired. And dearly beloved, that is grace. Grace. You are not seeking God. You who were not seeking God, you who were not working for God, you who did not care for God, and in fact, could not please God in that state of total depravity, have become totally pleasing to God. Presented before him without spot and without blemish. What wonderful truth. Well, I want to take a few moments to take you back in history to the Roman Empire 
one of the the laws that had been passed, as I've already mentioned in previous studies, the servant, the slave, had no rights. One Roman ruler, he had a, a large, I guess I'll call it a, a swimming pool built around his, his, his grounds, his place, and he filled it with electric eels. And every time that he didn't like a servant, he'd throw the servant in the pool. One time a servant broke a wine glass while he was serving him and this Roman ruler sentenced him to be cast into the eel pit and he fell on his knees, prostrate, and uh, begged to be beheaded rather than thrown to the eels. I'm sure I, I pointed out that an, an animal had more rights than a slave. And in the early 40s AD, AD 40, the Roman Empire passes a law. We've seen something similar in our country. And, and for a while, there was a tremendous upsurge of those who felt that capital punishment was wrong. They obviously departed from any biblical principle and misused the scriptures and cheapened human life. But there was a great move of that until some dignitaries were murdered. And then there, there began to be a feeling, well, after all, you know, maybe there are some cases where capital punishment would be justified, particularly when you kill some some important person, someone who's really kind of, you know, special. So in the 40s, the Roman government passed a law that it was a very bad thing for a slave to kill his master. If he stole from his master, he could be killed, burned at the stake, whatever. If he fled from his master, he could be killed or, or whatever his master wanted to do, torture him, basically anything that pleased, pleased the master. Some Roman ladies took great pleasure in putting oil on servants and burning them to light their garden parties. I mean, this, the odor must have been awful. So in the 40s, the Roman government passed a law that if a slave killed his master, killing the slave was in no way equivalent to making restitution for the death of the master. Therefore, all slaves, all slaves in the house would be executed because this is such a, a heinous crime. The uh, Roman citizens felt that if a slave killed his master, one life was not sufficient. You know, you'd just kill all the slaves in the household. But nobody, nobody ever thought a man of such stature and such wealth would have 400 slaves. And so the citizens arranged a protest and the protest was so loud that the Roman Senate convened to consider the matter. And after much deliberation, they concluded that the law must be enforced. And so the Roman legions were brought out and they lined the streets to control the crowd while 4,000 
hundred slaves were executed during Onesimus' time. What must have been in the heart of Onesimus? Four, 400 of them put to death as though they're nothing but dirt. You know, 399 of them were innocent. You know, one almost wonders how many of that 399 were in fact good slaves, did what they were told to do, were absolutely honest, worked hard. Yet they were executed. Now you need to understand, dearly beloved, you need to understand the condemnation that hung over Onesimus' head. Because that is what hung over yours. For by one man's sin entered the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. Now, you can, if you care to, you take God to task for such a statement. I, I will not. The sovereign majesty of eternity is a righteous God. Dearly beloved, dearly beloved, we are being forced to look at the life of Onesimus. The problem with modern Christianity is, is we have not, but instead we've diminished the righteousness and the holiness of our God. We stand utterly condemned and now we see through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and His intercession in our behalf that we, we who were totally unprofitable under the condemnation condemnation of death now stand before him totally profitable without spot without blemish holy unblameable and unreprovable in his sight and so we begin here at verse 11 verse 11 which in time past was to thee unprofitable but now profitable to thee and to me. It must have been beyond Onesimus' fondest dreams that he could be delivered from this condemnation. And it must have been beyond your fondest dreams as well and mine. And I sometimes wonder, I can't help but wonder, if our deliverance is as precious, as dear, as real to us as it was to Onesimus. Without any doubt, God Almighty took my hell that I might enjoy forever the courts of glory. Verse 12, whom I have sent again, whom I have sent again. Now, I don't know what translation you're reading, so I'm reading from the King James, but I don't know what translation you're reading, so I'll translate it for you so that it'll be correct. Thank you for laughing at that. If I read it from the authorized version, the King James Version, I lose some of the beauty, I, I believe I lose some of the beauty and the power of this verse. Whom I have sent again, Thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels. And I'm sure that, well, I, I got a pretty good idea that the translators labored over the Greek when they translated this. So I'm going to translate it again. 
whom I have sent again, him, that is part of myself, my very being. Now, folks, for Paul to write this of Onesimus is one thing. For the Holy Spirit to have it pinned for, for our ad admonition is another. Whom I have sent again. Well, the only logical conclusion to reach in the case of Onesimus is Onesimus belonged to who Philemon always did. He may have been unprofitable, totally depraved, but he was always Philemon's. Just because he ran away, didn't, he didn't cease to be Philemon's possession. Whose, whose name, by the way, Philemon, means love. Love. It's from the word phileo. Love. And the first thing that we see in this verse is the powerful realization that God's children always were God's children. Oh, to be sure, they were unprofitable. They, they sinned in Adam and, and they sinned in themselves. That's without question. For I was alive apart from the law once says Paul, who did I belong to? God Almighty. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Well, to whom did I become unprofitable? God Almighty. And I was born again by the word of God and, and by the power of God and I became profitable to the one who owned me who always owned me. Always. Dearly beloved, you will not find any scripture that says that tare becomes wheat or goats become sheep. Doesn't exist. You, dearly beloved, have always belonged to God, separated from your mother's womb. Paul was shown this when he was about 50 years old. He was separated from his mother's womb. His name had been written on the palms of God. The Lord knew the way that he took, and when he had tested him, he was, gonna, he was going to come forth as gold. No question whom I have sent. Again, there, there is no question of Philemon's ownership. The verse must be written that way for an actual fact. If we, if we only stick to the history of the account, Philemon owned Onesimus. You know, and you can argue that forgetting any spiritual vision in the verse, Paul couldn't write anything else. Onesimus belonged to Philemon. But... Dearly beloved, that is the point that I want you to see. God's children were always God's children. When they were unprofitable and depraved, they belonged to God. And when they're born again through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, they belonged to God. The, the question of ownership was never in any doubt. You know, over the years, I've had a number of people, people ask me, well, 
Pastor Steve, don't you believe that one has to believe and express faith and exercise faith to be saved? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Absolutely. Absolutely do. Any one of you that thinks that I don't believe that doesn't know me. I do not believe one needs to exercise faith to be redeemed, but he does exercise faith to be delivered. The question of ownership is the question of redemption. And that's not up for debate here in Philemon. Jesus said, I didn't come to do my will. I came to do the will of him that sent me. All that the Father has given me shall come unto me. I, are you saying God Almighty can give something to Christ he doesn't own? I, folks, that defies any common sense in language. All that the Father has given me shall come unto me. And of all that the Father has given me, I shall lose none. Did, did the Father have the right to give them? Absolutely. They were His. The question is, are the children of Satan God's? And... I believe that Matthew and Revelation say without any argument, they are not. But God, dearly beloved, God has the right to give his own and he gave them to Christ. They'll all come. All. They'll all come. Everyone is a precious gift from God the Father to God the Son. You were a gift from the Father to the Son. Whom I have sent back to you. Whom I have sent back to you. As I read that verse, I see something in the pronoun that speaks spiritually to me of the wholeness of Onesimus. Slaves weren't persons. Slaves were possessions. You know, you might even to some degree put human attributes, you know, uh, you know, on your animals. You know, I, I look at my horse and I wonder, you know, what he's thinking. If, if you know, if he's thinking at all, I don't know. But that horse would sulk if I scolded him. You know, he, you know, you won't talk to me for three or four days. And I, and I sometimes sort of put human attributes on the dog, but he's not a human. There was no difference between a slave and a table or a chair or a rug. But there is in this verse... I believe the Holy Spirit is stressing the wholeness of Onesimus, the personality of Onesimus. He is no longer to be presented and emphasized as a possession as much as he is a person. And I, I don't know what I do with the rest of the verse that says, this is the center of my being. I see in that, and at least I, I well, I ask you to, to think about it, that he is so much a person. Onesimus is so much a person that he's part of me, says Paul. It's part of me. 
I have friends out there. Many of you, I'm talking to you. You know who you are. You're part of me. I'm part of you. You're, you're part of me. When I send Onesimus back, I am really sending, I, I, I don't know that I should say part of me. I, I'm sending my innermost being. Is it, is it, is it, folks, is it conceivable that you are so important in the communication and the mediation of the Lord Jesus Christ that as far as God is concerned, you are the one being thought of by God in the person of Onesimus. I believe the verse is saying that Onesimus is now a person, not a slave, that we emphasize his position as a member of the family and the household of God rather than as a possession. Someone that is unprofitable. That, that he and Paul are so intimately connected together that, that it's as though Paul himself were going. that I am that close to him? Dearly beloved, we are hid with Christ in God. Think of, think of that. Think of that. In the epistle to the Galatians, he did not say seeds as of many, but as of one unto thy seed, which is Christ Singular. And we get to the end of the chapter. Those who are after the faith of Abraham, these, they are the seed. So there is a relationship between you and Christ that is so close. The singular is used. You are that intimately associated with the Lord Jesus Christ and he's coming back soon. part of me whom I would have retained with me that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. Verse 14. But without thy mind would I do nothing that, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity but willingly. Okay? Willingly. But because you willed it. Folks, Jesus said, I didn't come to do my will. I came to do the will of him that sent me. One of the great aspects of the mediation of the Lord Jesus Christ in your behalf is that he isn't doing something that he wanted to do that God the Father didn't want done. He, in fact, did what God the Father willed. And even in his mediation for you, he is absolutely submissive to the will of the Father. I didn't come to do my will. I came to do the will of him that sent me. And what is that? This is the will of him that sent me that you believe on him whom he sent and whom he has sent. Believe on him whom he has sent. I see in these two verses not only the fact that the Apostle Paul from a prison cell is making an appeal to a man in Colossae named Philemon, but I see in the Lord Jesus Christ one aspect of his mediation that I, 
I may not see in any other passages of Scripture unless I read it into our messages. Our passages that we read in, in John chapter 6 that, that Christ is not here doing something that was separate from the will of the Father. That in fact what he came to do was God's will. Now that's going to be a tremendously powerful thought as we go into the next verse. All right. Let me let me let me just whet your appetite here, you know, before we close. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. For perhaps he therefore departed. Folks, that is a passive voice. He was made to depart. Please don't miss this. Please don't miss it. He was, Onesimus was made to depart. Onesimus was made to run away from his master Philemon. Now, I hope you recognize that I've just opened a floodgate. And I'll talk, we'll talk about this a little more next week. Oh, what a marvelous, tiny glimpse into the sovereign God and His working, His operating in our lives according to the good pleasure of His will through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again for the time that you've given us to just study your word together. Filter out all of that which is foolish, that which is carnal. Seal to our hearts the truth of your word that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.